Hello to the chicos and the chicas. Back to book review. Boy, I have an absolute delight for you. Um, and that is today the book Rock Solid Chess by Sergei Tivyakov and Yulia Gök Bulut. If I am not mistaken, both authors um, are debuting with this book being their first. Could be wrong, um, but I think this is their first. And boy, what an introduction. Absolutely love the book. This, ladies and gentlemen, is a book, Tivyakov's Unbeatable Strategy, Pawn Structures. Right, we have heard of that many a time. In fact, can't believe it, I haven't reviewed this one yet. Everyone who watches me knows this book. I refer to it a lot. It's bloody amazing. So I had very, very serious expectations to a book that is... Uh, tackling yet again the topic of pawn structures. And let me tell you, Tivyakov and Yulia Gökbulit delivers and then some. Absolutely awesome book, love it to bits. The first thing that I would like to highlight about the book, which in my opinion, by the way, is uh, an absolutely brilliant idea, and I can't believe that no one thought about it before, is, is that he's discussing pawn structures in a very different manner from the mainstream uh, method of IQPs, hanging pawns, the whole shebang. Instead, what he does is, I will tell you what his uh, chapters are. So he starts off uh, in chapter one with pawn majority on the flank. So that's three versus two, either on the queen side or four versus three on the king side. Right, then he moves on to chapter two, which I think from top of my bed is double, the head uh, are double pawns, and a bucket load of examples for all kinds of double pawn scenarios. Then three double pawns part two, so that's more double pawns. Then, this is what I really like, semi-open files in the center. And then he offers you myriad of opening scenarios. I will show you one where there is a, um, semi-open file in the center. And so you are no longer looking at an IQP, which could technically be uh, fitting into that, but you are approaching the whole topic of pawn structures um, from not the pawn structure itself, but a side effect or, you know, a um, com not conclusion is, is not the word what I'm after, but, you know, like they create a situation, they have a consequence. That's what I was after, a consequence. And so he approaches it from uh, the consequence. For example, he doesn't discuss symmetrical pawn structures. Instead, he says open file or two open files in the center. A very fresh look at things and I really, really love it. The other thing that I absolutely love about this book is the way how he talks about positions and evaluates them. Tivyakov doesn't shy away from being contradicted by the computer or a great level of truth, but he talks to you from a human perspective and how humans play chess and how humans feel about positions. And boy, um, he does it really, really, really well. So yeah, I really felt like this book was talking to me in many, many ways. And on that note, I must warn you that um, Rock Solid Chess by Sergei Tivyakov is definitely a difficult book. And I would say that perhaps about 2,000, maybe even 2,100 fidei is what I would recommend to be uh, the entry level. So this is a, a more of a high-end book. In case you are wondering about the title, by the way, the guy remained uh, undefeated for like a hundred and however many games, a record that lasted for a really long time. And it was only Magnus Carlsen who uh, managed to uh, actually beat it. So that was a very impressive feat. Now, let me tell you and show you a couple of things and examples from the book that I really, really enjoyed. Let's take, for example, his game against uh, Stanislav Savchenko, a grandmaster as well. And uh, I'm going to skip the opening, or, well, not skip, but blitz through it. But I would like to talk about what he says right off the bat here. So this is a typical Tivyakov game. And boy, I loved every single bit of it. First of all, let me clarify this to you. Um, according to the engine, the position is 0 0.3, which in the grand scheme of things is dead equal, right? The 
vast, vast, vast majority of the games are drawn from this position. This is what he says. I have won many games in such positions. It seems that the position is absolutely toothless and that white has no real chance of an advantage, but this is not the case. In reality, white has dynamic play on the queen side. He can advance his pawns with the idea of getting um, a pass pawn. However, black lacks activity. Very important to note this. If he plays e5, then there will be a weakness on the d5 square. I will exchange the knight on b6 and then I will control the d5 square. From a practical point of view, white's advantage is palpable and black will not be safe by exchanging queens and going into an endgame. Um, and on this note, I need to bring you another interesting topic into the conversation that I think features the book throughout. You hear the expression of the Soviet or the Russian school of chess. No one really seems to know what that means. To me, in my life, especially in my younger years when I faced a lot of Russian players, what you see on the board and what he just said there is exactly the Russian school of chess. That I knew when I played a position like this with black, that it was equal. I knew that if I played the best moves, I would hold the draw. And I knew that I was going to get beaten by the Russian. Because they knew what they were doing. They had a crystal clear vision of the position. They understood the depth of it better. And they just beat me in it because, you know, I, I was running on the evaluation, whereas they were playing the game based on their understanding of the structure. Watch how he absolutely outclasses his opponent. Castles, bishop e7, rook d1, castles, bishop f4, still same, 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 lots of games follow this path. Queen a4, trading the queens. He mentioned that that's not going to be any good. Bishop e3, queen takes b3, a takes b3. It's a very important move to uh, understand that the knight takes b3 is a lemon here and a, b actually improves white's pawn structure, uh, opening up this, or the a file allowing b4, b5, restricting the pawns and so on. Um, knight d5, knight f5, whoops, adesa. Bishop f6, knight d6, another really clever move. Um, he's allowing this trade down here, and I think he's going to say something. Yes, that's what he says. b6, b4, comment. I'm not afraid of the exchange on e3 because the resulting isolated pawn is not a weakness. The opponent is unable to attack it. Great vision there. So he already sees that this is not a problem at all. On the other hand, b5 followed by rook a6, rook here is going to be totally destroying the opponent on the weak a7 pawn once again. Note the benefit of taking back with the a. Absolutely got to love this. Rook d8, knight b5, a6, knight d4, knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes, rook takes. And his understanding is such amazing. Like, at the t I just can't help but marvel how good he is with this. Takes, takes. And now, ladies and gents, we are removed 26. The game is going to go for another 10 moves from a dead equal rook ending as far as material is concerned. Here is his evaluation. I have increased my advantage on the queen side. I have four pawns against the opponents too. And now I begin to create a protected pass pawn on the C file by means of c4, c5. Black cannot prevent my plan. If he plays b5, then after centralizing the king, white carries out the plan anyway, which is b3, c4. Let's see how the game ended. King f8, king f2, king e7, king e3, b5, b3, rook c8. That's exactly what he discussed. King d3, rook c6, c4, f5, and c5. Now this move requires a great deal of understanding because now the idea is that we are going to play d5, ed, king d4 and then march on with king takes d5 or at least that's one of the main ideas but there are many more, more many more ideas. Um, so yeah, after g5 he played h4, a very cheeky move trying to lure the opponent to take and then he would come up and take, take, take everybody. Uh, opponent plays g4 and now there is the path to victory. No problems whatsoever. King uh, e3, king f6, king f4, h6, g3, and the opponent resigned. 
they ran out of moves or they will run out of moves a beautiful zook zwang and what i really really like about this game is is that at the final position material is still level we're dead equal in material and black is hopelessly lost if the rook moves we take a6 if the king goes back we just advance on and then d5 takes king takes will kick the rook lose the pawn allow us to go forward with the pawn just an absolutely amazing story there and i would really recommend you if you played through this game again to pay very close attention to how he plays the game from this position all the way like all these moves require very thorough thinking and analysis to here and then separately treat it as an as another game from here on now i would like to show you another marvelous example by him if i can find it um which was another absolute eye-opener to me and again the way how he describes and talks about positions is just so refreshing i really didn't used to like his style at all because he was the polar opposite of me his style was all about solid 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 do not lose and if chance allows let's win opposed to my let's go for it and go 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 but boy there is so much wisdom in his words and the way he describes positions unbelievable stuff check this out this is his position which i managed to spoil beautifully against rustamov so 2600 gm he is white this is what he says here about the position check this out my plan is to advance the h pawn not a plan that would occur to many by the way on club level h4 h5 h6 softening up the king side i didn't want to play knight f1 taking the knight away from the theater of the action and you already know that i'm a very positional chess player and take control of the center very seriously h4 didn't work right away because bishop takes g3 would uh, mess with my pawn structure um and so um it would be possible not only no i'm misreading it of course yeah he's talking about the trade on g3 white's task is to free the knight on g3 because i can't make use of it at the moment because of bishop takes h2 and so all this so he wants h2 h4 he can't do that because of the trade so what does he do he plays king oh and he doesn't want to move the knight backwards so what does he do he plays king h1 and if if you saw this move being played let's say against you you would be like what on earth is this guy doing i'll show you knight d5 bishop pulls back we're not allowing knight for bishop trade g6 bishop b3 listen to the comment and compare that to the move again and got to love his foresight and his preparation he says, with one move, I eliminate all possibilities for the opponent. There will not be counterplay with e5, c5, bishop f4, or knight 7 f6. The pressure is created on the d5 knight, and that's it. Black can't free himself. Wow, man. Like, wow. Because in this position, you got to watch e5, c5. We know that that's the main feature of the pawn structure. And with that move, he kills it all. e5, you take hit twice. c5, you take hit twice. Bishop f4, you take d5. They take d2. You take e6, and you win a pawn. Wow. Bishop f8, knight e4. And now, by the way, even if the black played the pass, knight e4 was good to go. Because bishop h2, and now you see the point of the king h1 move, is not check. So see ya, wouldn't want to be ya. Absolutely brilliant. Bishop f8, knight e4, b5, and finally, h4. And thus he carried out his plan, and uh, by the way, he ended up winning very, very quick. h5 was played, and he labels it as a loses practically at once. Because of rook g1 followed by g4, bishop g7, g4 takes, rook takes. Um, not sure if he discusses f5 here, I don't think he does. But I'm guessing that on f5 uh, we would have some uh, rook g6 uh, shenanigans. Yeah, take, take, and then queen g4, rook across. Yeah, this looks like carnage. Perhaps even rook g7 check and mate. Yeah, this is untenable. So knight f6 was played. And then after take, take, rook g5, the subsequent double aiming up with h5 is going to be 
decisive I will blitz through the game so that you see the the decisive tactic so if knight takes now there is a pin here too so rook g6 wins otherwise yeah and white mobbed up and won so once again rock solid chess by Sergei Tivyakov and Yulia Gokbulut, an absolute masterpiece. Um, I really, really enjoyed going through the book, and I've, in, in fact, I have gone through some chapters more than once. The depth of the thoughts and the excellent ways how Tivyakov and his co-author explains his th his thought process and his approach towards the different structure is a breath of fresh air amongst chess books and I really highly recommend it to those who would like to improve their chess, especially their understanding of chess, their understanding of pawn structures. Once again, I would draw the line at about 2000 fide, definitely not below that. But if you are on that level or higher, uh, rock solid chess is a must on your bookshelf. Thanks for watching guys. I'll be back with more soon.